So Sam is a naturalist. Her her real interest is in bugs and entomology. So we're hoping that we can look for some little egg cases or various types of things. So if you see something that you would like to uh, find out about, probably between all of us here, we can answer some really good questions. I know that Ira knows a lot about mushrooms. Um, so we can, can make, show where all the he'll show us where all the mushrooms are. And uh, that's what I love so much about coming out with these groups, because there's such a wealth of knowledge and you might think that you don't know much, but I bet you know things that we don't know. So please share with that. And so Sam, I'm gonna turn it over to you now and let us know, really, I wanna know about those salamanders. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll talk about some salamanders. Hi everyone, my name's Sam. I'm so excited to be here today. Uh, Blood Providence has a special place in my heart. I used to live in media for three and a half years. Now I live at the garden, uh, whatever. <laughs> but um, I really miss it, so I'm so glad to be back here. Let's go down into the park and we can try and figure out uh, if we can find any signs. Pretty much we're going to be finding signs of insects at this point. Um, but when we reach the pond too, I'll talk about um, some of our overwintering strategies for our turtles that live down there. Some of, on some trees in winter, you can really see them. But when you see lines of holes like this, it's generally indicative of a sap sucker. Does anyone know what a sap sucker is? Yeah, so a sap sucker is a type of woodpecker uh, and they're doing just what their name says when they're pecking holes into the sides of these trees. They're gathering sap. So, as opposed to gathering insects, yeah. So woodpeckers generally do feed on insects, but you need to get in much deeper than just these lines here. Um, so woodpeckers also generally uh, only attack dead or dying trees because those are the trees that tend to have more insects associated with them. Whereas you'll see sap sucker damage on living trees. And uh, mostly they don't damage healthy large trees, uh, but in some cases with smaller trees, which they tend not to, to uh, drill these holes into, but keep an eye out for that. All right, so what I'm looking for and what I'm gonna ask everyone to help me keep an eye out for are Chinese mantis egg cases, also called Uthika. So if you're not familiar with Chinese mantises, they are the really big ones that are four inches, sometimes five inches long. Uh, they're not native and some people consider them invasive. Uh, Yes, they can. There, there are multiple photos of them eating hummingbirds. Is that what I would call praying mantises? Yes, a praying mantis. We do have a native species, which is awesome, but they are about two inches long and very differently colored. And their egg cases look different as well. So actually in the garden, we actively remove Chinese mantis egg cases throughout the winter. So we'll cut them and we actually donate them to another land manager who has chickens. Um, so they can uh, have some fun with the protein packed egg cases. Um, they just eat it in that form? They can, or you can hatch them and then they'll eat all the babies. But that's always something to be considerate of because uh, then of course you've got some potentially rogue Chinese mantises. Uh, so the problem with, with Chinese mantises is a lot of their size. So when we compare two inches, to four to five inches, uh, that appetite, very, very different. So the Chinese mantises are eating larger things, they're eating more things, uh, and also there are many, many, many more of them. Each year in the garden, we remove about 200 Chinese mantis egg cases, and I have only ever found two of our native mantis egg cases. <laughs> So a lot of people say, well, they're acting as predators in the garden. And we say, yes, well, maybe a little bit too well. So uh, ultimately we're not gonna be able to get rid of them, but we can have a local effect. So, um, you know, sometimes people are going through their gardens and they'll see a pile of butterfly wings. I can guarantee if you look whoop, right up from there, you'll find a Chinese mantis. Uh, where our native mantises are not big enough to consume that much. So they have much less of a, an effect on our pollinators and they're eating things that are smaller like scales or mites or other things that we generally consider pests. But they are generalists, so they'll eat whatever they can get their hands on. But again, they're not eating quite as much. So 
Chinese Mantis egg cases look like little round tan styrofoam balls. You're usually gonna find them wrapped around thin stems of perennials or small twigs, things like that. And when we compare that to our native mantis, which is called the Carolina mantis, their egg cases are flat, they're dark brown, and they have a light stripe down the center. They're more rectangular and flatter, and they're usually laid on uh, trunks of trees. They don't wrap around a stem. So I highly doubt we'll find one of those. Maybe we'll get lucky, but let's keep our eyes out for the round tan styrofoam balls on small little twigs and stuff. As so walks. funny thing, I find praying mantises hatching when I'm um, harvesting wine berries. All the time. Yeah. All the time. I always have to be careful when I'm picking them to make sure they get in my little baggie and then I have to try to get the little half inch or one inch praying mantis less than less than an inch out of there. Interesting. So Interesting. There's, I know there's wine berries like right up behind there, so maybe on the way out we can. That see seems it. like a perfect those those really thin canes at the end mm -hmm. feel like a perfect place for that little oh, Chinese mantis to lay. <laughs> Um, so they're both going to be hatching around the same time and it's going to be, yeah, late June, early July. They're mature in August is when I find most of my, August and September, most of my adults. Did you have a question? They did. Um, are the invasive ones preying, no pun intended, on the native ones? Is that why you think there are less or is that just natural that there's less? So that's an interesting question. I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised if they eat them. I think it's a little bit more of competition. So um, they're taking that kind of predator space in those, in those, um, you know, small ecosystems, those little spaces. But it's possible they're actively feeding on them as well. So um, yeah, and with invasive things, there is just a natural lack of predators. So it could be that despite the fact that they've been here since the mid 1800s, our native predators like birds and things haven't quite adapted to eating those really big mantises yet. Um, whereas again, our smaller mantises might, they've been coexisting for a very long time, so they fit more into that predator kind of cycle. Sam, have you heard anything about the European mantises? Yes, so they're another of our non-native mantis. We have three non-native mantises <laughs> and one native mantis. Um, European mantis, in my opinion, is less prolific, at least in my experience in this area. Their egg cases are similarly tan, similarly look like styrofoam, but they're elongated. They're like ovals, uh, but they're also generally laid on the sides of stems. European mantises are smaller than the Chinese mantises, but still bigger than our native mantises. Right. So this whole kind of level. And then uh, our third non-native mantis is a narrow winged mantis. They look the most like our native mantis in size and their egg cases look most like our native mantis. But I also, again, have found that they are not nearly as prevalent as the Chinese mantis. And so. I think that the Carolina mantis was named Carolina mantis because that's where it was first found. But now it is all over the United Correct. States. Correct. It's think, an right? Eastern species. Yeah. So sometimes when something has Virginia or Carolina in the name, it doesn't necessarily mean that's the only place it's found. It means that it is one of the places that it's found. So, all right, let's see if we can keep an eye out. We're gonna keep our toes and feet warm. All right, so here we are at the pond. Uh, and during the season when it's warm and not frozen, there's lots of wildlife that lives in here. Um, it's been a while, but I definitely remember snapping turtles. Can anyone else recall any other wildlife that they've seen in the pond or even around the pond? Yeah, there are a number, of, there's like six turtle species. Painted turtles, I assume, mm -hmm. probably red-eared sliders. Yep. Um, red-eared sliders are a non-native species. Uh, if anyone was wondering, they are a common pet and the reason that they're often found in lots of ponds is because people are sick and tired of taking care of their turtles, so they release them into a pond. And it's so interesting learning about all the ways that non-native species have been introduced. Um, 
to the U.S. and to all different sorts of sorts of places. But uh, we do have lots of uh, native turtle species as well. So snapping turtle and painted turtle in here as well. If you think of any other species, right. let me know. Yeah, lots musk, of frogs. Musk turtles. I can't remember if it's yellow eared or bellied sliders, which are also invasive. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, that might be it. But. Okay. So. When we talk about our native turtle species, uh, they a lot of the turtles that we're specifically talking about here in the pond uh, need to be near water, right? Their, their entire life cycle kind of revolves around the water. Um, so in the winter time, right now, as we speak, all those turtles that live in this pond are underneath this layer of ice. Some of them have burrowed themselves into the mud underneath and they will stay there until the spring. It's very interesting. So water is a great buffer. So if we were to go into the water underneath, especially as you get down towards the bottom, it's gonna be much warmer than it is out here, the air temperature. Air uh, takes a lot less energy for it to cool down and for it to warm up, whereas water takes a lot more energy. So it needs to be much colder for much longer uh, in order to get cold down at the lower levels of this pond. And then add mud on top of that, and it's kind of an insulator. But in addition to that, these turtles have uh, lowered their metabolism. They're kind of hibernating, but when we talk about yes, turtles and amphibians, it's called brumation. It's kind of a different, it's a different way of lowering that metabolism. And one concern when you are frozen underneath of a pond is when that layer of water on top completely freezes, it limits oxygen uh, flow between the water and the air. So oxygen can't get into the pond. When this happens, turtles actually go into an additional state of anoxia. So they don't need to use as much oxygen. They change how their metabolism functions so they don't need as much oxygen. They can't do that forever. So here we'll, we know that this will probably unfreeze in parts as the temperature gets warmer, then it'll refreeze. So they can do that for days, even a couple weeks, um, but they will need this to thaw at some point in the winter for them to get that oxygen exchange. Um, box turtles do something a little different. So they are our only turtle species that can actually survive its internal organs freezing. Hmm. Whoa. So that's why all these turtles have to go underneath because they cannot handle having all of their internal organs freeze. But our box turtles are quote unquote freeze tolerant. So our box turtles right now have found burrows that are likely abandoned by groundhogs and other uh, mammals. So they're under the ground, but it still gets cold under the ground because again, we've got kind of that soil acting as a buffer, but it's not as effective as water. But what they do is they move all of the water outside of their internal organs, they push it out, and then they eject something that's pretty much equivalent to antifreeze into their internal organs. So all the water outside of the organs and all around their organs freezes. Technically their organs don't freeze because they've got that glycol or antifreeze in there, um, but they are frozen solid. They are frozen solid, which is crazy. And that also happens with some of our really, really early um, frog species, spring peepers, and wood frogs do something very similar. Push that water out of their internal organs and they freeze solid. And their body just makes that glycol. Yep, yep. So their body produces that glycol and then come springtime, they can unthaw within hours. Amazing. And they can be calling, <clears throat> mating, getting ready to go for spring within hours. So I've seen a picture of a frozen wood frog and it's the cutest thing I've ever seen because you know it's alive. It's just all frozen. <laughs> um, yeah, speaking of garters, they do something kind of similar uh, to the box turtles where they'll find an abandoned mammal burrow, but they don't freeze. What they do is they'll actually kind of hibernate with a group of other snakes. And so they'll, they're at all, all of our reptiles and amphibians are ectotherms. So obviously that's why it's very difficult for them to survive winter because they don't produce their own body heat. So what the snakes do is they get all together and they'll rely on radiant body heat to keep each other warm, but they do still enter a state of reduced metabolic function. Um, and those are actually called hibernacula. So that's the plural. 
but uh, the singular is hibernaculum. So often in the spring, late March, early April, you may see four, five, ten snakes all together out in the sun. And what they're doing is they're coming from those hibernacula, letting the sun heat themselves, and then they'll begin to be able to move um, after that sun kind of radiates on them. So that happens with our garters and lots of our other snakes as well. Do we know of any other snakes that have been found in this area? Yes, yeah, so the, the snakes that we've documented, yeah, it's only three. It's the northern water snake, the northern brown snake, and the eastern garter snake. Oh, cool. living a life. No beavers in here? Uh, I doubt there would be beavers there here. There are in Ridley Creek. Yeah, yeah that's a bigger, bigger space. Right. And, um, <clears throat> Yeah, they need more running water. Beavers are very interesting. So they create these kind of homes for themselves and they create them so they have a hole just at the top and it essentially acts like a little oven. So when over the winter time, they'll hibernate, rest inside of that home. Other mammals and other wildlife will also nest in that. They'll like share their home and their burrow with um, other mammals, but all of that radiant heat kind of gets trapped in this kind of round home that they've created for themselves. So, very, very cool. Lots of mammals relying on either some of their own species or some of other species to maintain that radiant heat, including flying squirrels, which are so cute. And actually flying squirrels, so they don't hibernate. What they do is they lower their metabolic rate, if, but if it's a warm day, they can go out, they'll hunt, hunt. <laughs> they'll find food and then they'll come back and they actually, um, in nest boxes, you can, they can be found, or cavities in trees. They stay together in family groups, and it not only keeps them warm, but it also helps promote family bonding. Um, so they go together throughout their lives, relying on family bonds in order to you know, help them survive. So I think that's adorable. Whenever I see leaves, hanging from a tree like this, um, you know, there's two things that are happening. Either one, the leaf wasn't let go. Uh, we see some trees actively hold on to their leaves, especially when they're young. Young birches do this, I'm sorry, beeches, and young oaks do this. And this is something called marcescence. Um, we're not totally sure why they do it, but one thought is, um, and, and only young trees do it, one thought is that herbivores like deer or other big things that might have existed prior to, to deer uh, coming through wouldn't want to eat those twigs because it's got the dry, crunchy leaves and it suddenly isn't tasty anymore. Another option or alternative is that there's an insect wrapped up in that leaf and they have used silk. Usually it's going to be a moth and they've used silk to attach, keep that leaf attached to the stem. So they've got a safe place and it doesn't blow around and doesn't fall to the ground. So I don't see any here, but anytime I see a leaf kind of hanging like this, I always wanna see, is it really curled? Is there sign of silk inside? Because um, lots of our, especially silk moths, will put themselves into a cocoon and they'll take a leaf and wrap it around as camouflage. Come spring, they'll emerge. Um, so this is a great reason to also, one, one reason why limiting cleanup in your garden in the fall is really important because there's so many examples of insects that are using our plants um, in our gardens to overwinter. And when we clean up, obviously we didn't, you know, be taking down trees or anything, but they'll do it on perennials as well. So leaving those perennials standing for as long as you possibly can is really important for letting those insects, letting that wildlife use your garden and become a really safe space for them. So. One thing you could do is look down right now and you'll see these little seeds. They're coming from this tulip hopper up here. You look up, Straight up there oh, in that yeah. very blue sky, yeah. you'll see the tree has some, looks like little whitish things up there, and it's actually a, oh, here you go. Thank you, Sam. You're welcome. It looks like a flower. It does. So that is, I forget the actual term for the whole thing, yeah. but um, 
That's a bunch of seeds in there. They fall out, little wings. And then, once they all go away, there's this. Can I be a host for the uh, yellow swallowtail butterfly? Yes, the tiger swallowtail. And they can also be a, a host for uh, luna moths as, okay, oh and uh, sweet gums as well. But like, once all of those seeds are gone, you're left with this super pokey thing. <laughs> And I often think if I am ever lost in the woods, I'm just gonna collect a bunch of those and I'll make a little weapon for myself. <laughs> yeah. So actually there's something right up here I can point out. And that is spice bush. So here is a spice bush. Spice bush is a fabulous plant. It's also pretty common here in, in the park because it's deer tolerant. So if you're looking for something shade tolerant and deer tolerant, this shrub is for you. So on these twigs, they're kind of light, light greenish gray. They've got these little white dots on them. Those are called lenticels. But the big thing that's helpful for identifying spice bush are these really bulbous flower buds. So you can see they're all up and down these stems. They're in clusters of three or four or sometimes five. They're very cute and they will turn into bright yellow flowers in the spring. So these flowers, they're really round. They kind of look like pom-poms. Um, they bloom really, really early in the spring before this has any leaves on it. Those flowers are pollinated by bees. And then this gets bright green leaves. Um, nothing super spectacular in the summer. It's a nice filler, but then come fall, Oh, they turn bright, clear yellow. The, the fall color is really nice on a spice bush too. And if you crush the leaf uh, in the summertime, it smells so good. And that's where it gets its name. Um, it would also happen if you scratched this twig. Spice bush is also the host plant for the spice bush swallowtail. Spice bush swallowtail, beautiful butterfly. It can only eat two plants, the caterpillar and it's spice bush and sassafras, both of which are awesome plants. So if you want spice bush swallowtails in your backyard, and you should because their caterpillars are adorable snake mimics. So they try and look like a little snake so that predators are scared of them. And if you give them a little gentle poke, they actually have something that comes out of their head that looks like a snake tongue. <laughs> Amazing, amazing. So, highly recommend you plant spice bush, and then you can keep an eye out for the adorable caterpillars. Plus, it's a beautiful shrub. And you can eat the red berries. And you can eat the berries. I know they kind. You can you can use them as a spice too. People, there's some chefs that say they like they gotta have them. Yep. Yeah, yeah. There's like it's like it's like uh, I don't know. It's really intense oil, like uh, how you mean or whatever. I'm trying to think of the stuff you use yeah. for cleaning off. Uh, you know, kerosene. It kind of tastes like kerosene. Which doesn't sound attractive, but, <laughs> but that's when you take the berry and eat it immediately. You can just take the in uh, the outer fruit. Um, you can do something just with the outer fruit, and you can also take the inner seed and treat it like you can crush it and treat it like a uh, like a spice that you use very sparingly. Yeah. You can also make tea and out of the berries. Yes, that's right. So much to love about spice bush. This is a good alternative to forsythia. Forsythia is a non-native plant. Um, it's on the invasive watch list for Pennsylvania. Um, so this is a good alternative. The flowers are not quite as showy, but it blooms around the same time. It's got a similar kind of form. And the, the kind of open habit that they have, really great for bird nests as well, specifically wood thrush which have the most beautiful song in, I mean, maybe not in the entire world because it's a really big world and there's a lot of birds, but in our region, I believe, in my opinion. So. Yes. See this little burl here? This little bump on the side of this tree? Oh, this tree doesn't look too hot, which is actually great for wildlife. Yes. So I do a talk that I call life after death <laughs> because when a tree is dead, it can be argued that it supports just as much or sometimes even more wildlife than it does when it's alive. 
And that's because there's a whole suite of wildlife that only can use dead or dying wood. Lots of different insects. They're really, really important because they help break down this wood. They kickstart that recycling process. And it's really interesting. So this is called a snag, which means that it's a standing dead tree. Yeah, this is a big one. This is a big one. No, so snags, it literally just means a standing dead tree. So, you know, this is maybe not something that every yard is capable of keeping. However, even cutting this off at 10 or 12 feet maintains a lot of those important benefits for wildlife while limiting the fall factor in your own backyard. Um, but a large standing dead tree is gonna provide the most benefits. So, like I said, there's a whole suite of insects um, that, that use dead and dying wood, and they actually help break down the tree at different points. So this is, looks like it's fairly newly dead. So there's gonna be certain insects in here that you wouldn't find 10 years down the road when this is really starting to crumble. There's gonna be a whole different suite of insects that are helping in that process. And then eventually this will fall and it'll become a log. Um, and that'll still help break down uh, with the help of insects and get recycled. And also once it's lying down, so many things like to hide underneath that log. But standing, it also provides habitat for woodpeckers, flying squirrels, because it starts to create these little cavities. So see this little round bit and see there's a hole up there? I can guarantee that there is something that has either lived in it before or is living in it now or using it for shelter. Cause that for me as a squirrel, that looks uh, perfect. Yeah. That looks beautiful. Um, squirrels are active um, for a long time throughout the winter, but um, that looks like a nice place to kind of take a little nap. So. So yeah, not that we've seen, but are they nocturnal? They're nocturnal, so <laughs> I can I can pretty much guarantee that they're here. Um, they're Yay. not as uncommon as people think they are. They're just really difficult to monitor. So the best way to figure out whether flying squirrels are actually in your green space is to set up a platform. People put peanuts out and a game camera. So it gets triggered when they'll fly in, pick up a peanut, woo, and then fly. I'm saying fly, they glide, they don't actually fly. Um, they'll glide in, take a peanut, and glide back out. That's the best way that you can kind of identify whether or not something is in your park, right? I want to set up game cameras everywhere. <laughs> so here's an example of marcescence. So I mentioned marcescence is when young beeches or young oaks keep their leaves. Um, you can see it's really actually very ornamental. It's a really nice little tan color. Some turn kind of bronze, uh, but you can see that these are young trees compared to an older tree over there, which seems to have kept some of its leaves, but especially if you look up, no leaves left up there. I don't know if you can see these footprints yeah. up here. Um, looks like it could be a fox. They were snowed over, so I can't quite tell, but based on the length between the strides, looks like possible fox prints uh -huh. right here. And we've seen him up here, haven't we? Yes. Definitely. Yeah. This is very interesting. Some sort of scar. Yeah, there are some of the weirdest scars in like growth patterns in some of these trees were like... Were these trees labeled at any point? Oh, that is possible that somebody... That's really interesting. It certainly could have been way back in the day. Yeah, I mean, they since did... it goes all the way around, it just... That's interesting. I don't know. Just looking at the scar on this yeah. tree, wondering what might have caused it, and I thought maybe if this tree was labeled at any point or had something wrapped around it, this could have been where the label started getting eaten. Oh, um, and if it was wrapped around the tree. Oh my goodness, look how cool. 
It's a perfect home for a raccoon. A uh -huh. raccoon. Oh, and are you seeing the... Uh... Oh my gosh! Whoa. Look, there's a bunch of nuts in here. Oh! oh. So there's something's eating. Something's eating in there. And this is the raccoon tree. That's so cool. Look at that. Oh, that looks so cozy. <laughs> I were a raccoon. So if you look up, when you get a little bit further, you'll be able to see. You have to look back at the tree and you'll see where the big hole is. So right. Oh, I see. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, so that's where I've seen a raccoon going in and out. Okay. Oh my goodness, look at that. Wow. And that also, so when we talk about holes or cavities, uh, great horned owls also use cavities as their nesting. I've been hoping that they would take that nest. I know, yeah, looking. they need, so great horned owls need a really big nest. So there have been records of great horned owl nests being uh, eight feet deep. Yeah. yeah. That's great amazing. horned owl, like the cavities that they've used and the nests that they've created in them, there's records of them being about eight feet deep. Yeah, they need really, really big cavities. Similar to that one. That one's looking promising for something even more than a raccoon. All right. This is burning bush. Oh, yeah. Um, very common invasive in these parts. Um, and introduced through the ornamental horticulture trade. So if you have a burning bush in your yard, I highly recommend you remove it. There's lots of great alternatives. Um, blueberries um, are a nice alternative. They get red color. Uh, viburnums can get some really nice fall color. Uh, that's the reason people plant burning bush. It's not really for any other reason. It has absolutely no value. At no, all no. That yeah, and when we talk about shrubs that do have value, viburnums are kind of really right at the top there. They support a lot of caterpillars with their leaves. They support a lot of bees with their really open, accessible flowers. And then they produce these beautiful fruits. Depending on the species, they can be red, they can be pink, or they can be bluish black. Um, and birds love dogwood berries and then they turn a beautiful color uh, and by dogwood I meant viburnum but there's also dogwoods as well um, shrubby dogwoods so many alternatives so get rid of that burning bush or tell your neighbor to get rid of their burning bush in a nice way you know? <laughs> in a supportive way <laughs> yes all right Oh, cool. Look at those dingle balls. Anyone so know big. what this tree, what tree this is from? Ooh, Sweet gum. Yes, platinus occidentalis. Oh Amazing. So also known as sycamore. So that means that there's a sycamore nearby. Yeah, there's one right here. And some other in Oh, the yes, area. yes. Yep, so if we look at this tree right here at the end, of the pond. If you look up, you'll see uh, at the top all of these seed balls and uh, it has exfoliating bark. So the bark peels Maybe. off of those oh. red tail hawk over there. Oh, there he is. Look. Shaking the snow. He's probably the one that has an injured wing that's been hanging out. So um, at Stonely and often when you go into cities or towns, you may see trees that look like sycamores, but they're actually London plane trees. And London plane trees are a hybrid between our American sycamore and the oriental plane tree or the oriental sycamore from Eastern Asia. So it's a hybrid between those two species and it's a little showier than our native, straight native American sycamore. So if we look at the trunk over here on this tree, it's gray all the way to the bottom, right? The exfoliation happens just at the very top of the crown and the canopy of the tree. But with, for instance, a London plane tree, 
that exfoliating bark actually comes all the way or most of the way down the trunk. So it's, it's more ornamental. Um, but if you're ever wondering, well, how do I know if it's an American sycamore or if it's a London plane tree? Now is a great time to figure it out. So when I say that it's a hybrid, it is a true hybrid in the sense of how many seed balls it produces. So Oriental Sycamore has seed balls in groups of three. So it'll have three all together. Our American Sycamore obviously has them in singles, ones, and the London Plane Tree is a perfect hybrid. So it has two. Oh, it has two. two. <laughs> That's interesting. That's yeah. So if you're ever wondering now, is a great time to, this is like the best way, the most um, kind of foolproof way of figuring out what you actually have or what you're actually looking at. So, but since they're in singles, this is American Sycamore. Well, that, I just, I didn't know that. I knew it was two for the yep. plane tree, but I never realized it was the- It's a perfect hybrid. American hybrid. Sycamore the only one that's like indigenous? That Correct, yes. yes. Yeah. I actually, I know that there's, I think there's like a California Sycamore, but I think it's the only Platinus yeah. in the Eastern genus Eastern. In, in like Eastern US. Yeah. Uh, so they are perfect, which means that the flower has male and female parts together on the one flower. Um, so we talked about the spice bush being dioecious, which means there's a male plant and there's a female plant. The It's separate plants, die too. There's also monoecious plants. And actually, if we're looking up at our these uh, Norway spruces up here, a lot of our conifers are monoecious, which means that they have male flowers or male parts and female flowers or female parts on the same tree, but they are separate structures. And usually the female will be at the top and the male will be at the bottom uh. so that the female cones can catch more pollen because they're wind pollinated. They're not pollinated by insects. So they're wind pollinated. So the male uh, pollen is all the way at the bottom or, you know, kind of bottom half of the tree. It gets blown up because usually winds kind of gust up. And then it's- You'd rather have the pollen drop. Well, so you want outcrossing. So you don't want, you know, one tree pollen, you don't want the same tree pollinating itself. Yeah, I always get it confused because I also sometimes think, I was like, well, doesn't it doesn't make sense for the female. Like, the female <laughs> so, but it's the females at the top. And if you look at some of these, you'll see that there's a concentration of cones at, at the, the top, top of the I tree. I always wondered why that was. Now well, you know, yeah, Marcia. Sumac. Sumac, yeah. Oh. We were talking about the buds of sumac. I realize we're we're straying away from wildlife and talking about plants instead, but <laughs> I will ultimately answer what do salamanders do in the winter? <laughs> I promise. Um, so see those buds? Yeah. See, they're really fuzzy yep. and they're really chunky. This is staghorn sumac. Mm. It's not big enough. It looks like to have cones on it yet, but like this is one too. Look how chunky it is. Yeah. It's just robust. Yeah. So cool. And it's soft. Yeah, it looks like the ends of the branches on that one like broke off. But yeah. that's just the way they, uh, yeah. they're just thick all the way at the end. And that particular plant has an interesting habit. It's what we would call a colonizer. So they're really good on hillsides. Roadsides. Roadsides. You'll see them like on the side of the uh, Blue Route and a lot of the um, various highways. They'll put them on this, actually plant them because they colonize and feed the birds. Yep. And they kind of spread spread, out. spread robustly yes possibly not a plant for a small media backyard no. <laughs> uh i have another sumac that i can recommend for that oh, which is winged sumac I love yeah oh yeah, yeah. oh look yeah. yes right so there. you can see the cones up there yeah, yeah. we'll see Thanks. birds love those seeds. they do oh my gosh you'll see little tit mice especially in the winter they'll sit it there and they'll just peck them out Adorable. Um, okay, so while I'm here, I am going to answer the ultimate question, oh, which is, what do salamanders do in the winter? Right. And here's the answer. 
It depends. <laughs> so, I know, I know. So, for a lot of the salamanders that we're familiar with, that we see often if we're gardening, like the redback salamanders or the slimy salamanders, very similar to our box turtle. They'll find a small burrow, they'll go underneath the freeze line of the soil, much warmer under there. All they need is for it to stay above freezing. Um, and they uh, similarly enter that kind of brumation state where there's really, really uh, low met metabolic rate, low heart rate, low respiration, all of that jazz. Um, but there is a species that can actually be active in the winter, the red eft. So if you're familiar with the red eft, it's the bright red small salamander. Um, it's got little spots on it and they live in streams and other bodies of water. They're active, they can be active underneath the ice. So there have been sightings of them actively hunting. People see it through the ice. They'll Ooh. see them underneath hunting. So they can be active throughout the winter in that unfrozen water. <laughs> Amazing, right? So again, it depends, but um, you'll see our salamanders start becoming active in April into May. And this is a great reason to leave your leaves. So I don't know if you're all familiar with the kind of uh, movement of leave your leaves, but when we talk about fall cleanup and even spring cleanup, blowing all of the leaves out of your yard eliminates so much habitat. Because we talked about all these, all these species of wildlife that are going underground, it's much safer for them if that burrow's covered with a layer of leaves, which it usually is because burrows are often made during the season, usually in some sort of forest or edge situation. The leaves fall, they create a nice little blanket and leaves are really insulating. So leave your leaves as much as you possibly can. Obviously we have lawns and that's okay. We have some lawn space, um, but if you've got a lawn, try blowing or raking those leaves gently as opposed to mowing over them, which is something that some people do because you are returning some of those, you know, nutrients back into the grass if you mulch mow it. But I talked about those luna moths that use, the silk moths that use those leaves. There are some species of insects that don't attach that leaf to the twig. They purposely fall because camouflage is fabulous, right? But if we're mulch mowing our leaves, those <coughs> insects cannot survive a lawnmower, right? I, I can't imagine any, anyone would be surviving a lawnmower. So if you blow or gently rake them into your beds or into some of the perimeter areas of your garden, you're gonna, really gonna be um, eliminating that destructive nature of mulch mowing. So um, another good reason to leave your leaves for the wildlife. But salamanders also use leaves in the season to um, kind of be safe uh, during the evenings. So like when the nights come, they'll hide themselves under layers of leaves to keep themselves warm and then they'll emerge again when the sun, when the sun comes out. So leaves are super, super, super important. So. Yeah, that was great. Well, yeah, thank you thank all you so much, much for coming. Yeah. If you have any questions, I'll hang around. I do need to start moving though, because my toes are going to be a little cold. I got to move. <laughs> I know. <laughs>